Hi, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar about Big Pharma as the new digital influencers. Um, we have people online and we are live here from Amsterdam. And my first uh, job is to introduce the speakers. I'm Tim and this is Dimity or Dim. So we have Dim and Dimmer as my <laughs> colleagues call us. Um, and we're going to be talking about, of course, um, digital influencers and Dimity is our, our digital comms officer. Um, a few acknowledgements, the, the communications team have done a great job setting this up, so thank you to them. And a declaration of interest, we don't receive any funding from the pharmaceutical industry. So that's a, a clear declaration. I'm going to lean forward just to change the slides here. Now, Health Action International was founded in the early 80s, and our vision is a safe, effective and affordable quality assured medicines for everyone everywhere. So our entry point is always about access to medicines. We do that through research, through advocacy, to create a policy um, space for dialogue and to um, improve access to medicines. But also tied in with that is the rational use of medicines. And that's really what we're talking about today, the way in which pharmaceutical promotion influences the rational use of medicines. So we have at the moment project areas, a uh, big project on access to insulin in Europe. We work on high priced medicines, on transparency, on um, health technology assessment, the health systems advocacy partnership, working in Africa on uh, access to sexual reproductive health commodities. More recently, we've um, been driving a program of snake bite treatment and prevention, again, in Africa. And of course, we, we have uh, an ongoing program of work around price availability and affordability of, of medicines and an, a pipeline project on the use of controlled medicines in low and middle income countries. And these are all about access. But what we're talking about here is the rational use of medicines. Now, WHO in 1985 said patients receive medications appropriate to their clinical needs in doses that meet their own individual requirements for an adequate period of time and at the lowest cost to them and their community. This is the rational use of medicines. And our proposition really is that pharmaceutical promotion distorts that rational use by promoting the use of drugs, either more expensive drugs or not necessarily those that meet their individual requirements or clinical need. And apparently we have a poll now. So, I think we're asking who is watching today. Well, somebody's watching. Hey, there you go. Advocates, healthcare professionals, students, thank you. That's really useful. Thank you. Mostly 32% advocates, 32% healthcare professionals. Wonderful. Thank you. So moving on now, we think about why pharmaceutical promotion takes place, just to frame the argument before I hand it to, to Dim. I mean, the first and foremost, of course, is accountability to shareholders, that uh, the pharmaceutical industry is required to give a return to shareholders. Um, so it's to make money. So the more drugs you sell, the more money you make. The second imperative is as a result of poor innovation. There hasn't actually been that much therapeutic advantage in, in the pharmaceutical market in, in, in the last years. And so the option then is to promote new products, but they tend to be on the whole me too medicines, more of the same. These are medicines that do something uh, or have the same action as an existing therapy, sometimes not even as good as an existing therapy, but they come onto the market and they have to be promoted. Disease mongering is a subset which um, implies the introduction of new diseases that were previously unrecognized. In other words, if you have a condition or you find an action of a, a chemical or, uh, that, that has an effect on the body, you can indeed uh, create a disease around that. There is, for example, a product for the life-threatening condition of short eyelashes available on prescription in the United States. So uh, disease mongering and the R&D modeling 
actually has a, a role to play in this because um, new drugs are awarded with patents, are awarded with high prices and monopoly pricing for any number of years. It means that uh, an industry has to chase a market, not necessarily health needs. So we don't really, we don't have innovative treatments for um, global diseases, but we have very much niche um, products coming onto the market. Now, just in case there were any uh, doubt about true innovation or whether or not it is marketing, this, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, I hope you can, but um, Prescria, a French journal, looked at 1,432 new products that had entered the European market between 2000 and 2014. And of those drugs, none received a Bravo, that is, really a blockbuster drug that really was, was life-changing or, or public health changing in the European Union. Only 2% offered a real advance. The, the, the big blue one at the bottom is that it's nothing new. There was nothing new coming onto the market, hence the need for promotion. So how much is spent on pharmaceutical promotion? And believe me, an industry will not spend on promotion if it doesn't work, if it's not going to change the way in which drugs are purchased. And here we have right at the top there, this is um, data from 2015. I'm reading very small print on our screen here. But the amount spent on promotion was 17.5 billion by Johnson & Johnson with 8.2 billion spent on R&D. So significantly more is being spent on promotion and it's being spent on R&D. And what's the impact of promotion? Why is it promoting irrational prescribing? Well, there's several papers and they're quoted on the slide. You can see them on screen. There's no evidence of net improvements in prescribing, but there is evidence of negative outcomes associated with interactions and, and promotion. The inability to identify wrong claims, the rapid prescription of new drugs, increased prescription rate, obviously the prescription of fewer generic drugs, fewer of the cheaper drugs, and many more of the more expensive medicines that don't necessarily do anything more than existing therapies. But does it work? I mean, we have the evidence that the amount of money that's being spent by the pharmaceutical industry, but in addition, we, how do we know that it's influencing? Now, this is an interesting study. It's quite old now, but I think it's difficult to repeat because everybody knows it now. But they asked uh, uh, medical interns about whether or not sales representatives in this case, but pharmaceutical promotion, have an influence on prescribing. And the intern said 61% it has no effect whatsoever. 38% has a little, and 1% said it really affects me. But 1% perhaps being honest, because when they ask them whether it affects other physicians, everybody said, oh, it really affects other people, but it doesn't affect me. And that's what we all think about advertising. We think of all the time when, and, and I'm shopping in, in the Netherlands, we go to Albert Heijn, and I don't know why there's a particular shampoo in my basket, but it finds its way there as a result of advertising. And that brings us to digital marketing. And I'm sure you'll recognize this person. This is Kim Kardashian. Actually, I had to be told who it was, but anyway, it is Kim Kardashian. And here she was in 2015 promoting the Clegus online. Um, this is actually Instagram, I think. I'm looking at my younger colleagues. Um, and this is direct to consumer advertising of a prescription drug. It, she was forced to remove this in 2015, but it has reappeared in different guises. And this is the point at which I back out and hand it to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. So as Tim said, my name is Dimitri. I'm the Digital Communications uh, at Ooh. Advisor at Health Action International. I just will quickly get my microphone on. What I actually want to know is if you are familiar with what, um, what happened with Kim Kardashian a few years ago in 2015, and actually again in 2017, when she promoted Diclegis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, post another poll. I'd be really interested to know if you're familiar with Kim Kardashian promoting Diclegis on her Instagram page, 
please answer honestly. If you don't know who Kim Kardashian is, I can direct you to a few reality TV shows. Okay. Okay, so this is really interesting. The assumption that we had was that perhaps people had heard about this uh, purely because it was huge news in the, in the United States. Um, but as we're seeing with this poll, majority of people have not heard about Kim Kardashian promoting Daclegis on an Instagram page in 2015 and again in 2017. So I will share these results with everybody. And I'll go into this a little bit further uh, in, in the next few slides. But first of all, I wanna look at some other aspects of digital marketing online. So, first of all, we have to look at what is marketing online? What does that look like? Well, there are a few different, uh, in fact, there are many different ways that you can market online. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm not going to go into the full scope of it, but we have Google, which in could include search engine advertising, display advertising, and search engine optimization. We have our websites, that's all part of the marketing strategy as well. So we have, again, in our websites, search engine optimization, display advertising, and we have informative articles. We also have sponsor content. This is a more subtle form of marketing. It's paid content on other websites. And we have social media. So social media is, it can be paid advertising and it can, it can be paying influencers, which is this Kim Kardashian case study that I mentioned earlier. We know that tr traditional marketing pharmace of pharmaceuticals is associated with an overdiagnosis, an overtreatment, and an overuse of brand name medications, according to Mans and All in 2014. And we also know that exposure to information from pharmaceutical companies does not lead to net improvements in prescribing that can negatively affect prescribing and professional behavior. So as we will see with digital marketing, it can reach people in new and more subtle ways that aren't immediately obvious to be marketing. And on top of this, digital marketing allows pharmaceutical companies to target people better than ever uh, in order to ultimately sell a product as, as they're profit driven. So in order to understand this better, first of all, we need to think like a marketer. So when I'm advertising online as a marketer, we need to consider who our audience is in order to promote our brand and drive up sales. So my first audience is healthcare professionals who there are a few of you today. When I'm advertising to you online, I want to change your prescription practices directly so that you're more likely to, to prescribe a certain medication. But another aspect is that I might want to target consumers. When I'm targeting consumers as a pharmaceutical company, I might have a few angles. The first is that I want them to purchase over-the-counter medications, which in many countries is legal to advertise to consumers for this. But I'll also want to increase the likelihood that they will seek medical attention for a possible condition and subsequently receive a med medical prescription. And also I want to build my brand awareness of the company so that the consumer might discuss this medication with their medical professional, which would indirectly affect their prescription practice. According to our online guide, Fact or Fiction, which provides information for healthcare professionals about pharmaceutical marketing in the European Union, We've quoted, available research shows that public information and disease awareness campaigns prompt people to seek medical care and that prescription rates increase for the medicine marketed by the campaign sponsor, even if the drug is not explicitly mentioned. So as we can say, see, marketing is quite influential and we can assume that it's intended to be influential online as well. Of course, there is regulation that we have to consider and each of the major players online do actually have their own regulation around uh, advertising for pharmaceutical companies. Generally, what they'll say is that over-the-counter um, pharmaceutical promotion is permitted for some countries and prescription is generally allowed for the US and New Zealand and in some instances, Canada, because this is in, in the US and New Zealand where it's legal. They'll also say, these companies, that it must abide by country regulation. So, all pharmaceutical marketing must abide by the country's regulation, which as we know, often relies on pharmaceutical companies self-regulation. So how do pharmaceutical companies then spend 25% of their marketing budgets on digital technologies considering these restrictions? Well, there are many ways. And as I said, I can only discuss a few. The first is Dr. Google. 
So as some of us are familiar, it's the first point of call for many of us for any query, but specifically with uh, health related issues, it's a massive area for people to, to Google their symptoms and healthcare related issues. According to Google health boss, David Feinberg, 7% of Google's daily searches are health related and 70, that equates to 70,000 searches a minute. So our goal on Google from a pharmaceutical company, marketing company perspective, is to appear as close to the top of the search results as possible. There are many ways to do this. And for pharmaceutical companies, this means taking advantage of the 70,000 searches a minute. One of these ways that we can do this is through something called search engine optimization. This has actually got increasingly more complex as people are going online more and more. But as a brief overview, this is a tool to help pages appear higher in the ranking. What it means is that you can embed key terms into web pages or blogs or information on your website so that their website is more likely to appear higher on Google. An example of this working is when you Google the phrase facts about breast cancer, on the first page you'll find the Roche article, eight interesting facts about breast cancer. It appears this technique can be used for every article, including those created about prescription medications. And I was unable to find any obvious or clear regulation in terms of using SEO terms. So you're able to use it to appear as high as possible. This leads us to our websites. Once somebody's clicked on the article, you're hoping that they go to your website. A website may provide general information on medications and conditions with the overall intention to sell a product. This is seen in this article, Eight Interesting Facts About Breast Cancer, that we saw earlier. This is designed to be an interesting article. It hopes to keep you on the, on the website where you may ultimately find information on medications, but also it's getting the data of those that have clicked on this, on this uh, page, which can then be used for better marketing for this pharmaceutical company in the future. So how do you create a good image for your brand on your website? Well, it includes the actual imagery, including pictures, logos, and colors used. But also we're thinking about the tone, the content, and the style, all with the ultimate goal to build a relationship. And that might be with a consumer or it could be with a healthcare professional. In some instances, websites do have hubs specifically intended for medical professionals to join in order to discuss medications and further their own learning through online courses. Not only are these websites and hubs intended to persuade prescription practices and the behavior of consumers, but every click that anyone does on a website is actually a very useful piece of data that any organization can use for many, many purposes. This might be improving their marketing strategy and promotion of medications, but also it might be used to target more appropriate people for the medications, work out which audience will be most likely to eventually buy and utilize the medication and other forms of, of marketing towards this and targeting. So as we've been, uh, as has been a global conversation, online data is extremely valuable to the companies and we have to keep that in mind whenever we're visiting these company websites, how they might be using that information. Of course, we also have paid advertising on other websites. So for the purposes of today, I'll focus on two of these uh, forms of paid advertising. The first is display advertising, and that's actually shown in this image here that you can see. This is a, an example of an ad that is called display advertising intended to give you brand awareness. We also have sponsored content, and this is a little more subtle. It could be case studies, it could be research, or it could be an, an informative article written and promoted on another website that directs readers back to a brand. We can see here, for instance, that journals might be targeted for this kind of information. So journals are useful because they are accessed by healthcare professionals. And as we can see here, there is an advertisement for Tremphia, which is a prescription medication for psoriasis. And it's on an article called Association Between Gifts from Pharmaceutical Companies to French GPs and Their Drug Prescribing Patterns. So this is a very clear example of when the marketing of this display advertising has been targeted towards people who are most likely to be healthcare professionals reading this article. As I mentioned though, sponsored content is very valuable to organizations 
and it's indicated by the steep price point for this kind of advertising. So we can see that a sponsored post buyout on a news or lifestyle publication could actually range between 50,000 to a million US dollars. And that's just for an, an article that will read like an informative, um, informative piece of literature and not be immediately obvious to be uh, for marketing purposes. It's uh, intended to provide information that, in, that could eventually persuade prescription practices to healthcare professionals or indirectly by consumers, as is mentioned. So now what I wanna show you is the consumer journey of when somebody, it could be a healthcare professional or in this, in this instance, most likely the person who might receive a prescription, what their journey looks like online when they go through doc, uh, Dr. Google, as we've just been talking about. So as you can see, I'm typing in how to treat epilepsy. I would scroll down and I'll find a piece of um, uh, some information around treatments for epilepsy, in this case for WebMD, which is one of the most popular health websites online. I'd scroll through the article and then I might see another article that provides further information on epilepsy as you're seeing here. This is actually sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. So when I click on that, I'm getting information about epilepsy, but I'm also ultimately being redirected back to SK Life Science, which is a subsidiary of uh, SK Biopharmaceuticals. So arguably this is intended for the consumer, as I mentioned, not for healthcare professionals, but the likely aim is to provide information on conditions that require pres prescription medications so that the consumer will then approach their own healthcare professional as an attempt to persuade prescription practices. Okay, so we've gone through Dr. Google, we've talked about the process of going on, on Google, typing in healthcare related issues and then going through their website. But of course, there's another, uh, another form of advertising online that uh, pharmaceutical companies are utilizing. This is the social media presence. So social media presence can be organic content. So providing helpful information uh, to those who have liked the page or to friends of friends who have shared that content with their, with their network. But we've also got paid social media advertising. So that's content that you put money behind in order for it to be seen more widely on, on your page. Paid social media advertising is very useful in some cases because it can target your message to relevant consumers. This could include ages, genders, and professions, for instance, healthcare professionals. An example of this is from Pfizer, uh, as we can see here. That links, it links back to the Get Healthy, Stay Healthy program, which is a Pfizer sponsored program. The page, as you can see here, gives information on lung cancer and also helpfully provides a downloadable sheet that you can take to your doctor. So we can see here that that might be hoping to start this conversation with the healthcare professional around lung cancer and, and ultimately medications. Importantly, every time you click on ads such as this, you're giving pharmaceutical companies more information about how you're engaging with the content, who you are, and how they may be able to better target you in the future to market their products. Which ultimately, as I mentioned, brings us back to Kim Kardashian. So for those who weren't aware, Kim Kardashian was reportedly paid 500,000 US dollars from Duchesne USA for that one post on Dacledges, which was a medication intended to uh, help curb symptoms of morning sickness. But she's also not the only one. So you may not know these influencers, but they do have a highly engaged community. Emily Maynard is one of them. She also promoted Dicledges and she received thousands of likes for this. Louise Rowe, who's pictured, pictured here, she promoted uh, a prescription medication, Otesla. And actually she wasn't giving any information about psoriasis, which is what this uh, medication treats, but she was creating a positive brand association, association with it. So actually she's working entirely within the regulations, but she's still able to market this direct to consumers essentially. It is endorsing a prescription only medication and it's endorsing it globally. So although they might be based in the USA, we're actually getting this, this message transmitted more globally. And if we think back to one of the intentions of pharmaceutical marketing, this is a really effective way to reach consumers in the attempt at influencing prescription behavior of their medical professionals. So you might be thinking, but does this actually work? Do paid influencers actually see any kind of change in the prescription practices? Well, 
Yes, some sources state that Dicledger's sales rose 21% in the months following Kim Kardashian's endorsement on her Instagram account. Another part of social media that isn't as obvious is social media for healthcare professionals. So these are online portals for medical professionals where you might go to seek more information or collaboration with other healthcare professionals. And it's clearly very valuable and very important in, in treatment, but it's not always, uh, it can be supported by pharmaceutical companies in some ways. So an example of this is one popular site that we looked into and it, it said in its privacy and terms and conditions that it did get the following information from its users. And this is in no means the entire list. So from the healthcare professionals that visited the page, it received their contact details, such as their name, email address, postal address, phone number, and social media handle. Other account registration information, such as their job title. Social networks that they have granted permission to the service to access your data on one or more networks service providers that help them determine a location in order to customise certain products to your location. And the website said that this information may be shared with their group companies and with sponsors, specifically those that wish to send you information about their products and services that may be of interest, may be of interest to you as determined by your choices in managing your communications preferences and other settings. So this is a lot of marketing jargon really, but what it actually means is that this data that they've collected could be going to their sponsors who are in this instance, um, instance pharma tech companies. So here's another poll. I'm interested to know with that in mind, where do you get your healthcare related information online? I will share this poll. Okay, so we've got a few answers coming in. As I can see that they're coming in, Google does seem to be one of the most common places. You should know that you can pick one, more than one for this uh, poll. So if you go to multiple places, please indicate in your responses. But Google really is the most used at this point. I'll share these results so people can see. So we've got Google, journals and government websites, and then pharmaceutical websites, other. So in summary, it is important to know that consumers and medical professionals do get valuable information online from all kinds of sources. That is the intention. It's, it's helpful, it's persuasive, but in the case of pharmaceutical companies, it is ultimately intended to sell a product. And it's not just the obvious display and uh, the obvious banner ads and display that I was talking about. It's the subtle marketing across your entire journey, journey online that also changes and influences behavior. So as a healthcare professional, it is really important to consider how this wealth of information may inform your patients and your own behavior. And this could be on prescribing, but also the information that you distribute and information that is given to you. Healthcare professionals and consumers alike are not immune to marketing. And that's kind of the very purpose of marketing. And that's okay. So instead of assuming that you won't be affected by this, as Tim mentioned earlier, a lot of people will. It's really important to be aware and continue to exercise critical thinking both on and offline by checking independent sources for information. So as we mentioned, we have a Q&A section and I'll bring Tim back up for this section. I would love if you could put your questions into the Zoom webinar chat that we're checking and we can answer these questions as they come in. Pretty good. No questions. No questions. No We've questions. answered everything. Of course, if you do have questions, we'll wrap it up soon. But if you do have questions, please feel free to email them through to comms. So C O M M S at highweb, H A I web.org. 
and we'll continue to answer those as they come in. We do have one question that's come in. And the question is, does the Google AdWords grants that Google offer to NGO make a difference? So Claudio is referring to the fact that Google does have opportunities for NGOs uh, to um, receive a grant in order to better promote um, Google AdWords. That's a, that's a complex question actually, actually, Claudio, because it might make a difference to the NGO specifically and, and improve their own um, ranking on the Google search engine. However, it would actually be a case by case uh, basis on whether it's effective for that brand or not. So we would need to consider what, you, what terms they're using, uh, where they're linking the content back to, whether they do have good search engine optimization. Uh, and, and actually, although it might be beneficial to receive a grant for those NGOs, it's hard to know if it makes a difference in terms of brand awareness or not. Um, Mandy, you, you asked what regulations exist for promotion via social media. Um, as far as I'm aware, in terms of, of uh, criteria for pharmaceutical promotion, there will be internal uh, regulations that are in the code of practice for the pharmaceutical industry. But our fallback position is, is usually the WHO uh, ethical guidelines for pharmaceutical promotion or similar. It's, it's, a, it's a title similar to that, which was uh, produced some time ago but it still remains relevant if it says in that that the, the recommendation is that pharmaceutical products should not be advertised to the public then that includes in my view social marketing social media marketing uh, what strikes me is that it's illegal to advertise prescription drugs to the general public in europe but not in the united states and as dimity pointed out earlier a, 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 a an original advert might come out in the United States, but because of the, the extent and, and um, transnationalism of the, the uh, internet, it means that we do receive those. I think that this needs to be looked at because I think that if we have direct consumer advertising via the internet in Europe, that is illegal and we should be uh, doing something about it. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk about the, the growth of e-pharmacy as well. Yeah, so, Catherine, yeah, I mean, it's it's not so relevant to the advertising, I suppose, but the e-pharmacies that you see a lot of, and even those which are uh, legal in the European Union, and they they have a they have to apply and they, for a, a, a regulatory standard, and they carry a green cross, um, they will only be carrying some products. Uh, they don't carry all products, and those products are usually lifestyle drugs. And effectively, they both promote and sell at the same time because you go to one of the e-pharmacy the e websites and it will just take you direct to erectile dysfunction and then you'll be straight into Viagra. So, I mean, I think it's, it's similar, but you have to actually seek those pharmacies out. So you're seeking that um, advertising. Um, Peter, what laws apply to online ads of prescription drugs? Instagram is based in the US, but can be accessed from anywhere. That's a similar, similar question. I mean, it's always struck me as odd that, that I live in the UK, but I work in the Netherlands and the BBC won't let me watch the BBC when I'm in the Netherlands, even though I pay a license fee in the UK. My point being that the BBC know where I am. So how come this can't be applied across uh, the internet to uh, ads which are forbidden in, in Europe? And, and Gopal, hi Gopal, nice to see you online. Uh, any study in India or developing countries? That's for you, David. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there are actually Gopal, and um, I I can actually link them to you at the end of this study. So please send us an email to comms at highwebs, highweb dot, uh, org. So c o m m s at highweb dot org because I, I specifically came across a study in India, um, and but its details are completely lost on me at the moment. So I'll send through this study to you, um, which could be of interest to you. Um, Peter, just to follow on from what Tim said about um, the laws of, uh, of prescription drugs on, on Instagram, as I mentioned, there are regulations around um, what can be um, promoted on different 
different platforms. So Facebook has its own set, which is Facebook um, operates Instagram. They have their own set of regulations, which are country based. So they'll say that you can advertise certain ads in uh, in America and you, and you can't in the Netherlands. But where it becomes a gray area is uh, this Kim Kardashian example, because there are no geo targets, there's no way to know where her, where her, uh, her followers are based and they won't limit what people generally they won't limit what people are seeing of her Instagram feed so although it direct to consumer advertising isn't allowed in the Netherlands we're still able to see that ad although it was taken down and replaced with a similar ad um, we're able to see it all across the world or in most places in the world because um, there is no moderation of that at the moment So those are all the questions that we have at the moment. If there's any final questions, please send them through. Otherwise, please email us at comms at highweb.org. And I've just seen my colleague has also shared a link to our survey. So would really appreciate your feedback on this webinar. If there was anything that we missed or anything that we could include for next time, uh, please click on that link. It's a, it's a quick five minute survey and it would really help us to make this even more relevant and worthwhile for you next time we do this webinar. Any final words, Tim? No, thanks very much for looking and, and for joining us. Um, I feel like we should sign off in some way, but so from, from Dim and Dimmer, um, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.